thank you all for joining me. I'm happy to be here, and I hope you have had a nice weekend so far. I thought it would be a good way for us to, you know, uh, kind of conclude or, or complement our Sunday activities and do a live stream on our text reading starting with Exodus. So I'm going to, we're going to start Exodus text readings today. We'll get started a form, more formally in a few minutes. <clears throat> and then I'm probably going to do several shows this week, maybe even in a row, tomorrow, Tuesday. Maybe not Tuesday, I have one thing Tuesday that could get in the way. And I might do uh, several, if not all of the text readings this week after today in the early morning. So if you wake up and you see me live doing the text reading, um, you can watch it, whatever part you missed after I'm done. But uh, we usually start around 6 a.m. California time or 7 when we do them early in the morning. So thank you all for joining me. Like I said, we'll start in just a couple minutes. Um, we had to get the mic thing right, and <laughs> I'm glad we did. So let me just make sure I have my settings correct here. And then, so I'm going to be doing more text readings this week. We'll start Exodus today. I'm going to do a summary from our last text reading from Genesis 28, the Jacob's Ladder text reading, all the way through to today's reading. And then we'll do the reading. I'll go over some of the Exodus text support. And I didn't add that to the note or the description in the video because it was already kind of long with the reading. And But now I've got it kind of summarized down. I'm not going to list it the way I did with the Genesis text support, you know, all the different texts. I'll just, I'm going to give more of a summary, kind of like what you're going to see in a moment. I'll put that in the description with the links I'm going to show you for some of the key representative text witnesses of Exodus. And that's just, you know, that's important to know so you understand where uh, we are with the text history of what we're reading and its relationship to the actual events described. And then we will do part five this week, the Bible and the Trinity in conflict. And as you know, this isn't about, you know, I know it is hard to avoid. It's not about creating uh, difficulty or conflict with Trinitarians. It's about showing where we believe as Christian witnesses of Jah or as non-Trinitarians, the Bible and the Trinity do not agree, right? It's not about disliking the Trinity, at least not for me. I said this before in one of our, um, one of the other parts to that series. If the Bible taught the Trinity, I'd have no, you know, that, that'd be fine. And I try to accommodate it, even though I don't think it teaches it, to those who I think are just spiritually so used to it or think they need it, like a, a means of a, of understanding what is said in the Bible about gods or God. and So rather than use the sons of God theology that I talk about and promote, according to the biblical text, in my belief, you know, they use the Trinity. So I try to just look, you know, fine, you're confessing Jesus, okay, it's too much. But it never really just stops there, does it? <laughs> it never really just allows for the continuation of Christian activity or non-arguing. So, you know, we can always hope. But we can't hope, if we hope, <laughs> we can hope, but we don't want to lose sight of reality while we hope. And so in the meantime, while we have these difficulties with people, and we're not united, the series, I believe, will be helpful because the Trinitarians don't always leave us alone, right? It's not like we run after them. Some I know do. And it's not like I've never, you know, engaged a Trinitarian and, and felt that I was helping them to try to correct them. But, you know... Over time, you realize, hey, the most important thing, at least in my view, confessing Jesus Christ, praising Jah, golden rule. There's details, there's there's other truths associated with those, but beyond what is written, we try to just let it go. So, but, you know, so to the extent possible, I try to make allowance, but I, I know it's not possible. So we have to have some ability to discuss things like the Trinity with others who might make it more difficult for us. To either help them explain why we don't fully accept it or why we, we think they're nuts. No, I'm just kidding. Some of it, right? Some of us are nuts. Sometimes we're nuts. Like I've said before, we've all had moments where... We're, we're, by nuts, I guess I mean just overly enthusiastic in a pharisaical way where we think we're so right that we're actually wrong and we can't see it. Something like that, right? <laughs> Depends on whether you believe it. But, you know, so I don't mean, as I've said before, when I say people are nuts 
or retarded. You know, I try not to use that word, but you know, it's it's a real word, and I don't think it's really a problem. People make it a problem, right? It's like with all the other stuff, right? If you stop using this word or that word, I know some of them are. You know, we try to avoid. It's not. Um, <laughs> it's not beneficial in ways to where using them solves more problems than not. And but, and I'm not saying retarded does, <laughs> but there are you know. There's only so many ways you can say certain things, and they know I don't mean it in a real disability type way. So it's just my way of referring to them without saying, you know, hey, because they know, right? When you're talking with like a Trinitarian, you're talking with someone who already knows. Or when they're talking to me, right, I already know. But yet we act like we both don't know, <laughs> right? And so we got to tell the other one, yeah, I know you've studied the text, I need to write it well, but you don't understand it yet. <laughs> So you see what I'm saying? Even though we each do clearly know what it says or have read it and believe we can see, we each think the other one doesn't know. And so there's kind of a <laughs> element there where I think uh, it's like retard or <laughs> spiritually retired, right? It's not like meant to be mean. It's more humorous in a way that allows for disengagement. <laughs> I hope anyway, right? Is my way of just saying, look, man, if I had an actual, you know, disabled person yelling at me outside, I'd be like, whoa, whoa, no, can you handle them? And <laughs> I, I'm not going to, you know, it's, there's no value in it. But there is value in these texts, right? <laughs> so we're going to get to those next, uh, next in like one minute here. One minute, we'll start the show. I'll do a little summary from where we left off, like I said, but. So we'll do more text readings this week. We'll do today's show. I've been really busy, and I'm going to try to be consistent. And the deeper we get into these regular texts, the more I, I, I will be. But it's just a lot happening. Things are busy. But I'm committed to at least trying to do a weekly video, hopefully live stream, so that we can be connected in some way in addition to what we're all doing. Right? If you're like me, praising Jah, trying to follow the Christ, teach the golden rule, right be a good person or we make mistakes try to account for them, right this is all the basic things that i think when you read these texts and the people in them you know what to do next and you want other people to do the same and so that's why we do these readings and today is going to be the first one in exodus all right so let me just double check then while i have you all here how our screens are going to look and then we'll get going all right, let me just make sure I got the reading in a good way. You can check it with me. Let's take a look. It's a little small, huh? And, you know, I try to set these beforehand, but sometimes, you know, even though I go over it and I have things sort of ready, I can't always do the fine-tuning part until close to the show just because of the things I have to do. In any case, let's see what we can do. Let's go up a little bit more. Does that help us? I put the reading below too. So most of the time, except for a few cases, I put the whole readings below. Especially now that I'm abbreviating the um, tax support. That looks pretty I think about as good as we're. We might, let me move that over. Okay, and you know, there's just at the way I have the split screen set. I may have to adjust this the split screen just to show. Give a little more room. So I don't have to. Well, so I can make it bigger, basically. All right. All right, I think that's about as good as I can make it for this this time. But you can listen, follow along in your own text, and, of course, I have the reading in the description below. Or if you're a member of the CW Jaw Forum, then you know texts are kept there. They're updated regularly. I'm working through Proverbs right now. I'm, I've got more Proverbs 23 texts I'll be putting up later today and tomorrow. And I should finish that chapter soon. So we got text readings this week, today, and, and either tomorrow or Wednesday, Thursday, maybe maybe all of those days, possibly not Tuesday. 
We're going to be doing several Exodus readings this week, starting in just a minute with today's. And then part five, Bible and the Trinity in Conflict, more in Hebrews 1. And then next Sunday, this is the last part I wanted to get to before we start. Excuse me. I'm going to do a, a redo of C.W. Jaw Talk on um, Ancient Aliens and the Flood. Because I had uh, clips from videos on the from the show, and it was copyright taken down. So that's fine. I'm going to expand on it. I'm going to go through all of the Ancient Alien videos. That was just information from one of their, their uh, episodes. But um, I've gone through all of them that, that in any way where they comment on the flood, the history of the flood, what they think about the flood. And where I'm just going to still shot parts of those episodes and discuss them. And we'll see what they show. But it'll be pretty much like the first one, but more. More information. We'll do it live. And so that'll be next Sunday, Jaw Willing. CW Jaw Talk, I think 12 or around there. If you go to the CW Jaw Talk playlist, you'll see around there the one on Ancient Aliens and the Flood. It's not there. It's not me. They took it down. So it's fine. We'll redo that, and then we'll move forward to CW Jaw Talk 31, where I'm going to show the evidence I believe we have to point to Jahua, Jah, as the eternal intelligent life who gave life to life, which we showed exists in CW Jaw Talk 30. But I want to redo the Flood and the Ancient Aliens episode before we go to 31, because the Flood is part of that evidence, right? And, of course, we've talked about it in the day text on Genesis and other shows, but... I want that video to be done so I can refer to it in that video as part of the, the body of, the, of evidence we've discussed previously. And therefore, it will, it will make uh, the part of uh, CW Jaw Talk 31 where we talk about the flood um, easier, I think. So that's the basic plan I have going forward. And then I have other videos on other stuff I'm doing um, more on insurance-related um, subjects. but. That's pretty much where things stand with the uh, the CW Jaw videos and things on this channel. So let's go ahead and start here. Get our reading in Exodus going, right? Let me make sure. So we have that. Okay, and then I want to um, also, Vera, let's um, make sure we have this. Okay, good. We'll get to this in a moment. <laughs> Texts, all these texts, man. <laughs> Great evidence, information, support the veracity of these accounts, historicity, all that stuff. So we'll get we'll get down to it in just a moment here. Okay. Probably about 20 seconds, we'll start. <clears throat> okay. I think we're good. And let me just verify you guys are... Uh... Okay. Everything looks good. <laughs> I'm ready. So I want to be able to see you guys, though. There. Okay. writing <clears throat> hello and welcome to tax readings with Greg Stafford that's me and what we do is progressively work our way through ancient biblical texts and records as well as related histories beliefs of peoples who live during the same time that events in the Bible are described we just concluded our text readings in the book of Genesis 
according to the translations I've done to date of the Hebrew and Greek texts. I had only done most of the texts in Genesis from chapters 1 through 11 and then part of 28, where we last left off. Today, we're going to be doing our first text reading in the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus, like the book of Genesis, has a great deal of manuscript and historical support. For example, let me bring up for you a couple of texts that represent the book of Exodus. One of the earliest texts that we have that supports part of the book of Exodus is, is a text that's not as well known as some of the other uh, texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is known as the Passover Papyrus and it's from Elephantine, uh, an Egyptian colony, um, where in the fifth century we have a text that has several uh, sections of different biblical books, one of which is Exodus 12. It's written in Aramaic, and here's an image of it now. I'll put a link in the description below so you can review this on your own after the video. But this is a 5th century BCE text in Aramaic that supports the book of Exodus and several other parts of biblical books. We also have a Hebrew text from the Dead Sea Scrolls, or rather, uh, this is a Hebrew text that's not from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the Nash Papyrus, dated to the 2nd century. And it also supports a part of Exodus, uh, part of chapter 20. And so here is a second century um, Hebrew text, not from the Dead Sea Scrolls, in addition to the Elephantine text from the fifth century. And then of course we do have Dead Sea Scroll support for the book of Exodus. This is the earliest text or fragment we have of a text of the book of Exodus dated to the mid third century so around 250 BCE I'll put a link again to this below so you can look at these fragments on your own but you'll be you'll be able to get a good idea of the type of text we have what they look like and be able to discuss the evidence with people so that when you read the accounts or reference them, you'll also be able to understand at least some of the best available evidence we have for the book of Exodus. All right, now let me go ahead and pull up our reading. We're going to be starting in chapter two, and that's because like with Genesis, I have not translated all of Exodus. I started in chapter two, as I was working my way through different biblical books and have been for several years doing various day texts, text readings and research as well as specific uh, translations or, or, or work done for the specific purpose of translation uh, which I'm working on now for the book of Proverbs in addition to the other texts that I do but I'm primarily working on completing the book of Proverbs so I've skipped parts of these other books like Exodus while I finish up Proverbs. But we will be reading um, the first 10 verses of chapter 2 and I've done pretty much most of chapters 2 through 4 and then um, several sections of subsequent chapters. So we'll read through all of the texts and get as much out of them as we can until we go back around through to Exodus again where I should have more text for us to review. Now just to summarize since we left off last in Genesis 28 and Genesis goes all the way to chapter 50 in terms of the number of chapters and content. So to bring us up to speed a little bit where we last left off in in Genesis 28 was the section of text dealing with the account involving Jacob's ladder and the stairway to heaven and so after this, Jacob meets Laban. And through Laban, he meets and marries his daughters, Leah and Rachel. There are, of course, many details to these accounts, but I'm just giving a quick summary so that we can get to our current reading. 
Jacob ends up marrying both Leah and Rachel and has sons through both of them as well as from their maidservants. He has one son through Rachel named Joseph. We then get a, a summary of the history involving Esau and the people in the mountainous region of Seir who were there and met up with and lived with Esau or Edom and all of his descendants after he separated from Jacob. And so eventually we get to a part between Genesis 28 and today's reading where we get a brief history of Jacob starting with Joseph at age 17. And it tells us the story that many of us have heard or are familiar with where he is hated by his brothers because of the way he talks to them and he reports bad on them as well although he's loved by Jacob and eventually he's sent out by Jacob to check on his brothers who are out tendering the flocks some ways away and his brothers see Joseph coming to them and he had also told them a couple of dreams that they <laughs> didn't like for good reason right I mean because it involved them bowing down to him as well as ultimately Jacob and even Rachel, depending on how you see them as the sun and moon and his children as the stars. But moving on, so we get to the point where Joseph is betrayed by his brothers, sold to Ishmaelites or Midianites, traveling to Egypt, and then Joseph is eventually sold into Potiphar's house. So then Joseph grows, becomes trusted by Potiphar, right? He's the chief officer of Pharaoh chief of his bodyguard he entrusts Joseph with all of his house and he becomes beautiful in form the Bible says in addition to having the authority of the chief of the bodyguard of Pharaoh and so Potiphar's wife you know, makes passes at him he rejects her out of loyalty to Potiphar she eventually forcibly tries to take him his robe comes off she grabs it he flees Right, he does. He says something very interesting. I, I'm lingering on this for a moment because he says something. Um, he says, Pot, "My master has given me everything and not withheld anything but one thing. You know, you." And it made me immediately think of the account in Genesis involving Adam and Eve and Jah. Right, because what was that? It was very similar to to what uh, Joseph goes through with Potiphar and his wife, only with different different subjects, different different elements. Because did not Jahawah Give Adam and Eve everything and not withhold from them anything but what? One thing. Do not eat of the tree with the knowledge of good and bad that will cause you to die. You're not ready for it yet. They did it anyway. right? So Joseph, the way he's talking, the way he describes it, it's very similar. Although he does the right thing, yet a sinner. right? It shows that we can still resist that temptation, although we can't always do it because we're not perfect. We're not like Adam, and even though he was perfect, he chose to do the wrong thing, but Jesus did not, so we have life through him. This is the story of um, the Bible, basically. But back to our text reading and the summary from Genesis 28 to now. So, nonetheless, Potiphar's wife does what, right? She's rejected by Joseph because he's trying to do good. She doesn't care. She then lies, tries to get him killed or, or at least, you know, in prison like he is. He's put in prison. He eventually meets up with uh, the chief of the of the bakers and the cupbearers, tells him their dreams, and then Pharaoh finds out that he can interpret dreams because he has a dream and no one can interpret it. And so in this way, after Joseph tells Pharaoh about the dreams involving the fat cows and the and the skinny cows and the healthy um, sheaves or grains of wheat and and the unhealthy and how they devoured the healthy. Same with the cows, right? The story of the famine coming, the, the seven years of plenty and the seven years of bad famine. So he tells him about all that and, and then he tells him to appoint someone who's capable of handling all this stuff and that's what Pharaoh does. He appoints Joseph over everything, right? Everything. And he's given a daughter of whom? A priest of On. Has two children by that daughter, who are there also at the time, well, when eventually Jacob or Israel comes, 
with the 70 belonging to him. And so there ends up being 72 that are part of Jacob's family that, that start this spread of Hebrews in Egypt. But prior to that, just to finish up the summary, so after he's appointed governor of Egypt and the famine ensues, right, then Jacob sends the remainder of his sons to Egypt. Joseph finds out who they are, right, and then he goes through all the series of tests and things to eventually uh, become reunited uh, with Benjamin and his father. Right? And then it says Jacob is brought to Egypt. Pharaoh gives him all the land, you know, in the opportunity to be in all the land. And Jacob's there for 17 years in Egypt. He's renamed Israel, and he's in Israel's in as Jacob in Egypt with J Joseph, his family, and all and all Jacob's other sons and their families. And everyone comes, it says. For 17 years, and then he dies at age 147. He met Pharaoh and blessed Pharaoh, it says, at age 130. Right? Because Egypt at that time was dominant in the land. And Jehovah knew that. Jehovah had brought Abraham up out of Ur into the land of Canaan. Made promises to him and to Isaac. And then he made the promise to Jacob and to his children. And Jehovah is bringing him into Egypt to preserve them during this famine that is being brought upon the land. So, they're in the land. They become very numerous, right? The text goes on to describe, and it says that the Pharaoh who knew Joseph, eventually Joseph dies. It said Jacob was, was embalmed in Egypt, and then he was taken to the land of Canaan to be buried with his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And it said they all went with Joseph, right? The, all the Egyptians, the officers, a, a massive procession, incredible honor. Uh, shown to Jacob and, and to Joseph and to all the Hebrews by the Egyptians at this time they were living together. And it's interesting, you know, in the text it said, even though they were this close, all these things happening, Joseph really as number one, but really as number two, in, in a way similar to, but identical, of course, to John Jesus. But nonetheless, that was how Pharaoh wanted it. And so it says, nevertheless, right, that that Joseph... And the Hebrews, when they were together, the Egyptians wouldn't eat with them, even when he was uh, head of Egypt, because it was just their custom. They didn't like it. They felt unclean being around the Hebrews. So you can see where the, the early seeds of, of distrust and not, of racism really rise. It's very common. It's not uncommon at all. Used against us all the time. Not right, but at this time, even more so, uh, the case that it would, it would take root because of the national pride. And so you have this new group of people coming in. Even though Joseph is being used, everything's going okay. You've got the right Pharaoh. Then things change. That Pharaoh dies. Another one comes and eventually doesn't know Joseph at all. This Pharaoh who arrives, whether it's the one right after or another one. Either way, the, the detachment that, that began by not eating together in that way, as I mentioned a moment ago, grew to the point where at the time when the wrong Pharaoh showed up, abuse um, ran amok and so that's what began to happen the Egyptians began to take advantage of the Hebrews instead of working with them and growing together they sought to take advantage of them and they became afraid of them thinking that they would side with whom the other nations when war broke out so the distrust that they had allowed to take place early on even during Joseph's time didn't help them at all later on. It just grew to the point where they just trusted them more, the more they grew. And so it came to be that, what, Pharaoh wanted to kill their firstborn? And then when he he couldn't get that to be done because the Hebrews kept giving birth before the midwives could get there and kill him, then he just wanted to kill all the sons, right? He went nuts. <laughs> and that's where we are right now. At the point where after the Hebrews have lived among the Egyptians for some time. All these things have taken place. Now we have an evil Pharaoh, or Pharaoh doesn't know the Hebrews in the way that the one who appointed Joseph did, and the, the ones who at that time came to know them and live with them to some extent meaningfully, even though they had some discontent, right? They wouldn't eat together. They were still divided. And so this grew even more. 
to the point where they were abused, enslaved, and now their children are being threatened because they're becoming more populous than the Egyptians. And so this is the setting we enter into as we start our reading in Exodus 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, Hebrew translation. Then a man who came out from the house of Levi began to choose a daughter of Levi as a wife. Verse 1, Greek translation, Now there was a certain man out of the tribe of Levi who picked one of the daughters of Levi, and he held her intimately, or married her. That's all it takes, or took, at this point. I mean, obviously, things grew and have grown to the point where we have ceremonies, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that if you do it right or choose to do it. But it's not necessary in every case if what you want is a wife or a woman. And so that's why we read it this way. This is how they did things. Verse 2, Hebrew translation. Now the woman began to conceive, and eventually a son was born, and she could see that the child was good. So she began hiding him for three months. Verse 2, Greek translation. The woman received a child in her belly, and she gave birth to a male. After seeing it was handsome, she protected the child. For three months, right? Because remember, at this time, Pharaoh's going nuts. <laughs> he tried to use the midwives to get to the firstborn of the Hebrew wives. When that didn't work, now he just wants to kill all the sons. So it's not one that would be defective in any way or one that would be too difficult to cover up. It's in health. It's in good form. So she covers it up for three months. Verse 3, when she had not been able to hide him continually, then... She started to take a box container made of a reed plant and she started to cover it with bitumen or asphalt and with plant resin or pitch. Then she began to set the child in it and to put in the reeds on the edge of put it in the reeds on the edge of the river. Verse 3 Greek translation But when she was not able to conceal the child any longer the mother took a basket for him, and she coated it with a mixture of asphalt and plant resin, or pitch, and she tossed the child into it, and she placed it into the marsh alongside the river. What does that remind you of? Right, we have a box container covered with bitumen or asphalt. It's like a little ark, huh? And, you know, it's often seen as, you know, the mother putting this little ark into the river and it going down the river. Or at least some do. But it really just shows she puts it into the marsh, into the area of the reeds along the edge of the river. It seems to me to be so that it wouldn't go very far, but would be discovered by someone. In any case, verse 4, But the woman's sister was standing alone from a distance to learn what would happen to him, to the child in the ark, the little mini ark. Verse 4, her sister was keeping an eye on it to learn what would happen to him when it started to go away. And as it either moved along or maybe according to the Greek version, it literally was moving along. But nevertheless, she was in a stationary position, right? So it couldn't have moved that fast or far because she's still watching it. Verse 5, Then the daughter of Pharaoh started to come down to wash on the river. Her girlfriends were walking along the side of the river when Pharaoh's daughter began to notice the box container in the middle of the reeds. She then began to send one of her girlfriends so she could take it. So obviously it was a def well-defined box, well-made, and meant to be noticed. Verse 5, Greek translation, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash upon the river, and her favorite friends were walking along the river and they noticed the basket in the marshy place. After Pharaoh's daughter noticed the basket, she sent one of her favorite friends to pick it up. Verse 6, Hebrew translation as she started to open the box container and to look at the child, why, it was in tears. So she decided to have mercy on it when she said, this one is from the children of the Hebrews. See, so where she might not have otherwise been merciful, 
the fact that the child was crying, you, you, you mothers, you women, and of course, I think we all know when we see a child in tears, at least most of us, right? There's some women, some men today who might not fit that profile, but nonetheless, it has an emotional effect. And in this case, the daughter of Pharaoh, while realizing it was a child of the Hebrews, had mercy on it because it was crying. Verse 6, Greek translation, as she opened it, she could see the child weeping in the basket. And the daughter of Pharaoh chose to spare it even as she said. This one is from the children of the Hebrews. Verse 7, Hebrew translation, then the sister of the child began to say to the daughter of Pharaoh, Shall I go and call for you a woman from among the Hebrews who is serving as a nurse? So she will nurse the child for you? Verse 7, Greek translation. The sister of the child said to the daughter of Pharaoh, Do you wish that I should call for you a woman serving as a nurse from among the Hebrews and who will nurse the child for you? Verse 8, Hebrew translation. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the young girl started to leave and she began calling the mother of the child. Then the daughter of Pharaoh said to her, verse 8, Greek translation, Go. After she left, the young girl called the mother of the child. So everything's working out, you know, pretty good. Verse 9, Hebrew translation, Then the daughter of Pharaoh began to say to the child's mother, Bring this child and nurse him for me, and I will give you payment. So the mother of the child took him, and she nursed him. Verse 9, Greek translation, Later, the daughter of Pharaoh said to the child's mother, Carefully watch this child for me and nurse him for me, and I will give payment to you. Then the woman took the child and she nursed it. Verse 10, our last text for today's text reading, and then we'll go over a few points, talk about what's coming up next. When the child began to grow, then she brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he came to be as a son for her. So she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I have brought him out of the water. Verse 10, Greek translation, our last text for today. After the child matured, his mother brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he came to be a son for her. She called his name Moses, saying, I took him up out of the water. So that's a good introduction, I believe, to our text readings in Exodus, followed by the summary that I gave at the start of the video, connecting the se sequence of events, the main points anyway, from Genesis 28, our last text reading, to today, where we reviewed what took place at the time after Joseph died, after Jacob and the 70 were, were with him and the two children of Joseph and the daughter of the priest of On lived in Egypt and grew and became many to the point where once a new pharaoh took over, the Egyptians didn't like seeing that many <laughs> and they began to oppress them, to put them under hard labor and to do the things that would lead eventually to what we're going to be talking about. The kind of dispute where they are enslaved and Jahawa sees his people, the people to whom he made a promise. The people whose fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all those who belong to them, including Joseph. The promises that Jahua made to these ones that would come true to them in spite of this condition that was brought upon them because the Egyptians didn't like them very much. Now, that one time they did, right? They were getting along, working together well. Kind of like the opposite of the way slavery worked a little bit in this country, wouldn't you say? I mean, slavery has always been the case, especially back in these days, but not so much at this time in the same way. And of course, in more modern times, the modern slave trade, you could say, really began with the Muslims and the North Africans, Nigerians and others, and eventually Europeans, white, quote-unquote, even though I don't think color terms are appropriate, but I use them for convenience at times. 
then began to work with African slave traders and continue the process until what? Slavery was ended. So in one sense, you could look at it as, you know, the opposite, like I said. In the case of the Egyptians, they came in in a good way. With Joseph as their, the ruler appointed by Pharaoh, brought them through the time of famine, brought in all his family, showed respect, blessed Pharaoh. But then what? Then times changed, and then they were brought under the yoke of slavery for hundreds of years. Whereas in more modern times, you could say that many Africans and others were enslaved, brought to places like the United States or parts of it, wrongly, under the worst possible conditions, right? But then things got better. In many respects, because of people who believed in Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people who claim to believe in him also owned slaves or claimed or had slaves. But that we know, and in, whether they did or not isn't ultimately for us to say, right? Even in people in the Bible did or didn't have slaves. and Whether or not it was a similar way, it was a different time. And the fact is, we're not Jesus Christ. So while we know that slavery is wrong and we wouldn't do that today, during different times it was something that took place. And it's easy for us to look back on it and say these things. And, and what we say is probably true in looking back on it. But we're not the ones who make the ultimate decision, are we? Not in the case of Egypt and the Hebrews, nor in the case of the Muslims, Africans, or Europeans. We have to do our part individually to try never to be abusive to any person, especially when we get along in a good way already, right? Just like Joseph and those with him and the Egyptians for, for a good period of time. Jacob was there for 17 years before he died. And they embalmed him, it says, for 40 days. The typical time that they take. So they gave him the full honor they would give to an Egyptian. And then they took him back to the land of Canaan. Joseph petitioned Pharaoh and they let him. They sent the royal officers everything. Jacob even had blessed Pharaoh when he arrived at age 130 and Pharaoh gave him everything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Think of what that is like versus what it is like in our reading now and what we're going to be reading next. It's terrible. But it wasn't always that way. Remember Genesis. Right? Even though our text today is for Exodus and that's what we started with, the summary of events leading to this text and what we read, very important how the, the Hebrews got in Egypt in the first place. What happened when they were there? How long they were there? How well they were treated? How well they got along with Pharaoh and all the Egyptians, although they wouldn't eat a meal with them? We forget all these things. And that's why I like to do these text readings, to help remind us, to help remind myself all these important events and histories and things that we can learn from and teach others as well. So keep that in mind. Don't always think of the time when the Hebrews were in Egypt as the worst possible time. It gets, it gets to be that <laughs> until their deliverance, right? We'll get to that as well. But before then, when Israel arrived, when Jacob and all those with him and Joseph was ruler of Egypt, that was a special time. We'll talk more about it when we go back through Genesis, and I've done more translations of those texts, and we focus in on them. But it's very connected with what we read. So I want to make sure to highlight it. And so we can keep it connected with those events as we read the events which follow and take us deeper into our study of Exodus. <music>